Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Christian. Uh, I'm self-employed hardware and software developer, and I'm also a research scientist as a research company. Uh, but I'm really happy to be here today to talk about my hobby project, actually, which is uh, combining brewing beer and brewing electronics. So I will present to you Bruce uh, my setup for brewing beer with Zephyr, Android, and ThinkSport. Um, so here's a small overview of my presentation. So I will first start with why am I doing all this. Uh, then I will give you a small introduction into brewing beer. I guess there are many hobby brewers among us, but still I will uh, give a short overview of the process of brewing beer. Um, then I will talk about the first steps I made towards um, creating this setup. Then also talk about why Zephyr and finally present the architecture of my setup. Um, so start with why. So brewing beer or beer is one of the oldest cultural beverages uh, around. So beer, humans already brew beer for thousands of years. Uh, and now you might ask yourself, why am I showing this piece of uh, papyrus? So this is actually uh, papyrus and I, re and I read it last week uh, in the news in, uh, in, on an online news portal. Um, because the University of Graz actually discovered that, that this piece of paper was part of a book, and um, which, make, which makes it to the oldest known page of a hardcover book. Why is this interesting? Because this piece of paper contains text about beer, and it's dated back to 300 BC. Um, just for some clarification, this is actually some tax information for beer, so from the ancient e e Egypt. Um, but still, you see that brewing beer and drinking beer is already uh, among us for quite some long time. And um, why am I doing all this? And uh, this is actually the reason. So uh, I brought this bottle of homemade Zephyr pills. So now imagine you're going to the Embedded Open Source Conference, to the Embedded Open Source Summit, and you can bring your own homemade beer to the conference. And you already see the sparkling eyes. I, I see already the sparkling eyes around you. <laughs> but this is actually pretty nice, not only for the Embedded Open Source Summit, but also if you brew beer at home and you bring it to um, birthday parties or to weddings or whatever, everyone is happy to try out some homemade beer. Um, how did it actually start? So uh, actually the beer brewing, so my dad started brewing beer about 20 years ago. Uh, my dad is teacher and he uh, actually brewed beer in school with his students. Uh, so I, 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 I need to tell you that <laughs> I need to tell you that my uh, dad teaches or my dad was actually teacher for the gastronomy and he taught about uh, beverages and drinks and brewing beer is also part of it and this, this is the reason why they also did some beer brewing back then. And I actually didn't know this for quite some long time until he celebrated his 50th birthday and he made a batch of homemade beer and I actually didn't know that he brews beer in school uh, and this was then the time when I jumped in 15 years ago. Uh, and ever since we started brewing beer I always wanted to automate the process. So I'm informatics guy, I always do automation of stuff. Uh, so that's actually one of my motivations in brewing beer to also create my own setup, which actually does all the process. Um, so here's a small overview and, uh, on, on the processes that are actually necessary to brew beer. So uh, the brewing beer process is actually divided into those uh, those steps, so you first start with the meshing process, and I will get back to the meshing process uh, right in the next slide. Uh, then after the meshing process, you have the lottering process. This is the process where you actually separate the grains from the liquid. Then you have the boiling process where you add in some hops for flavor. And finally, you have the fermenting and the conditioning process. So those steps are actually necessary. Um, and then you have some optional uh, processes that are normally done in, in big breweries, so home brewers normally do not do the filtering and packaging stuff, uh, but um, as already said, uh, the most important uh, processes are those five over there. And uh, the meshing process is actually the process which is uh, 
really interesting because this is the process where you extract the starch from the malt uh, and dissolve it into the liquid. Because if you want to make beer, you need some starchy liquid uh, for, the, uh, for the yeast in order to, uh, in order to uh, convert the starch into alcohol and CO2. And this is done by activating enzymes in the malt. And those enzymes in the malt are activated at different temperatures. So they are temperature dependent, uh, which means that you need to hold uh, certain temperatures for a defined period of time in order to give the enzymes the time uh, to extract the starch from the malt and dissolve it into the water. And um, you, of course, need to heat up all this stuff somehow. Uh, and uh, when we first started brewing beers, we did it all manually and we did it with uh, uh, a very uh, strange setup. But then at some point, I actually chose to get one of those induction cookers, which are very famous among uh, beer brewers. It's a 3.5 kilowatt induction cooker uh, with a manual control knob. Uh, and the reason is because it's actually pretty strong. So it had 3.5 kilowatts and we can make up to 50 liters of beer. And um, it, it actually uh, works pretty fast. So as soon as you heat it up, it, it gets heated up really fast. And if you cool it down or if you switch it off, then it also cools down pretty fast. And this is actually pretty nice to control uh, the process. So the induction cooker helps me to heat up the mesh. Uh, and you can do it manually. And many people do it actually manually. Uh, but the problem is that doing it manually is a little bit hard because you take measurements every now and then and then you actually uh, adjust the uh, potentiometer and then you're too hot and then you're too cold and it's uh, uh, a, a tough process actually. Uh, and this also affects the consistency because if at some point you're uh, very um, satisfied with, uh, uh, with one of your recipes, you want to repeat it all the time. Uh, and in order to repeat it all the time, it's actually nicer to do it automatically with a process that do it, does it actually pretty uh, in a stable manner. So in order to do or to implement my own um, uh, control uh, brewing, brewing setup, uh, I said, okay, let's reverse engineer the induction cooker. Uh, so I made this list. I said, okay, what do you need to do? I need to identify the control unit. I need to identify the controller itself, read out the flash, and then reverse engineer the flash. Sounds pretty easy. Um, so this is the inside of the induction cooker. And uh, figuring out the control unit is actually not that hard. So you do not have too much chips on there. So it, the, the chance that you're actually choosing the right one is, is, is pretty high. And after some, uh, some, some closer look to the devices, I found out that this guy over there is actually uh, the microcontroller who does all this stuff. Um, what you do not see in this picture is actually the manual control knob over there because it's mounted on, uh, on, the, on, on the cooker itself. Uh, and after some uh, reading out of this, of this controller, I figured out that this is some Samsung S3, F94, whatever uh, microcontroller. Um, so the first steps are already done. So I figured out the, the control unit. I identified the, control un uh, the, the, identified the controller. Then the next steps are reading out the flash and reverse engineer the flash. So, uh, I took the controller, tried to read out the flash. I got only zeros because, of course, they're protecting their flash. <laughs> um, so reverse engineering the flash is also not possible anymore. So uh, my first attempt actually failed. Um, then I took the data sheet of the controller. Uh, I did some measurements on, on the board. And uh, the next idea was actually to uh, reverse engineer it a little bit differently. So in actually, uh, what I actually wanted to do is to connect a logic analyzer to the controller and record the control unit. Um, so I connected a logic analyzer. Uh, and then uh, I wanted to control or record the control unit. I plugged in the induction cooker, and it was gone. Why? Because I didn't notice at this time, 
but the ground is somehow connected to Earth, <laughs> and I killed the induction cooker. Uh, so uh, I, I had to get a new main PCB for the induction cooker because I was still motivated to do it. So uh, recording the control unit wasn't possible anymore. So let's get back to this, uh, uh, to this PCB, to this uh, main board. Uh, my next idea was actually to uh, have a look about uh, have a look at this part. So this is actually the uh, human machine interface or the a human interface device uh, because we have the seven segment display over there and we have the manual control knob and they are connected to the main PCB over there about this uh, over this uh, connection and I thought okay why not just reading out this stuff and uh, doing it in this way. Um, this was actually done also pretty fast so I figured out that uh, I have the ground I have five volts and I do have two pins over there where I get the uh, the, the signal to switch it on and off and I get this uh, analog signal for the power input to the, uh, to the device. All right, so I started with all this knowledge and tried to make up a prototype with a Raspberry Pi. So I tried to build up some uh, a basic setup. I used a breadboard, I used GPIOs to switch on and off uh, the induction cooker and I tried to create some digital to analog converter to control the power. But the problem was that with the breadboard and all the setup, it was really not practical. Um, so uh, this, I, I was not really happy with this setup. Uh, and then, now I need to tell you a love story, and this is not the love story when I fell, fell in love with my wife. Um, it's the love story when I fell in love with Sefer. So, as I already told you, so I'm now working as a research scientist in Austria, but back then I was also working as a research scientist at Vienna University of Technology, and I was working on um, smart farming projects in a big European project, and we had a partner in Austria, a chip company or sensor manufacturer, who told us that they just recently bought another company and they had some nice chip, and if we would like to use this chip and I said of course send me samples I'm always free for samples I always want to try out different things uh, and this was actually called assembly and uh, it was programmable with an Arduino IDE and with the setup and loop control I pretty fast got stuck with all the stuff so I needed another way and I figured out that in this assembly they actually used an NRF uh, 51822 and then I tried to figure out a way on how to program it differently. And that's the re that's, that was the time when I actually tried out Cepher for the first time. And then I developed with Cepher. And uh, the thing when I actually fell in love was when, uh, when I got stuck with the Bluetooth stack. And I was online, wrote to some developers on Slack, told them about my problem. And within 24 hours, I got a solution and that's why I was blown away and was like, oh wow, uh, uh, I will stick with this RTOS forever. <laughs> so uh, the idea was to now take this simply stuff and put it into this PCB. Um, so this is the idea. So I come from uh, the, the human machine interface, get into a uh, designed board and get um, forward it to uh, the main PCB. And then additionally, because I also need to control the mesh, uh, the meshing process, I need a temperature probe uh, and I wanted to control the, the temperature sensor as well. So this was the first prototype with the Simbly. Uh, as I already told you, it's based on an NRF chip. I had this uh, RC network uh, with an PWM making the uh, DAC. And I added a type K thermocouple with this MAC31855 chip in order to uh, read the temperatures. And I also had some 3 volt to 5 volt voltage, level voltage converters. Uh, so I set everything up. I had the electronics in the cooker. Uh, I created some Android app that actually controls the stuff. Uh, I, get, I got to the power cord plugged in the induction cooker and it was gone. 
Uh, what I didn't realize or what, what, I, what I didn't think about is that the type K thermocouple has a metal uh, shielding and the metal shielding actually was connected to, <laughs> to the induction cooker and it was connected to earth and everything blew up again. And my father told me for the tenth time, why don't we just buy a ready to use beer brewing setup? And I was already so deep into this and I already invested so much money that I couldn't get back anymore. <laughs> So I had to get up with a new setup and the new setup was actually with a remote temperature probe. So I'm just having the control unit inside because this actually worked okay. Uh, and I just need to get the reading somehow. So I created some remote temperature probe and uh, the app or PC, whatever you're using, uh, connects to the temperature probe and to the induction cooker and does all the process. So the KUKA hardware, the new KUKA hardware that I built up here, so the new revision, is based on an NRF52840. Uh, I added an operational amplifier for this uh, digital to analog conversion stuff because I had problem with the old version. I removed the thermocouple. I didn't want to connect it anymore to the, uh, to the housing of the uh, KUKA. Uh, and this is actually the PCB I finally came up with. So I can connect it into the induction KUKA. I can also connect the manual knob so I can connect it, so control it manually and we're Bluetooth low energy with an PC or an app. Then the temperature sensor was based on the Simbly because I had some more Simblys lying around. I took this type K thermocouple stuff uh, from the induction cooker controller to this remote sensor so I put a MAX31855 uh, to this board. I added some battery manager, some battery management because I'm now uh, not connected anymore. So I need battery and also to charge the battery somehow. Uh, and this is actually, I call it the snake. Uh, this is actually the temperature probe. So there's the simply inside and the MAX31855 with the thermocouple over there measuring the temperature. So this was the setup, it works pretty well, but if you're brewing beer, you also need to somehow uh, move around the liquid because if you heat up just on the bottom over there, it gets hot pretty fast down there, but not up there. And in order to also uh, get some movement into the mesh, uh, I added some uh, another controller. So this is actually a controller that controls uh, 230 volts in order to switch on and switch off a pump as typical um, beer brewing kits uh, are doing this. So I have those three devices connected to my uh, smartphone app, the pump control. Um, I, I got a little bit away from, from designing my own PCBs and soldering my own PCBs. So I used an uh, ready to use particle argon or xenon whatever was available at the time, uh, but basically it's still the NRF 52840. Uh, it's connected to a solid state relay, which switches on and off uh, 230 volts. And I also have an additional Nokia uh, 5110 display because I had so much lying around at home. <laughs> That's the only reason. And I actually do not need it for switching on and off the pump, but I mean, it's still nice if you see some icons over there. Um, so this is the hardware. Uh, I programmed the driver for the Nokia display, uh, programmed anything else, uh, and you see the particle argon uh, here in the background. Uh, and this is actually uh, works also pretty nice. So you can, I think, control up to 1.2 uh, kilowatts with the solid state, um, so solid state relay, but the pump anyway just consumes 30 watts or 60 watts, so it's not that much. All right, and this is my final setup, uh, and it works. <laughs> I didn't kill any any uh, any other uh, induction cooker so far, um, but what I still wanted to add is some uh, possibility to also remotely monitor all this stuff. And because I was already using uh, an Android phone uh, and already had set up a ThingSport instance, I thought, why not also? Uh, creating a ThingSport dashboard and I commit or send all the information with MQTT to a ThingSport uh, instance to also remotely monitor all 
the, uh, the setup, and of course, all of the hardware that I'm using here in the induction cooker, in the remote sensor, and also in this uh, 230 volt switch, uh, run the Cepha operating system. Um, the Bruce Android app, so it's a native Android app written in Java. Uh, it connects to the cooker, it connects to the sensor, and connects to the pump. And this is actually used to control the meshing process. Um, it sends all the data with MQTT to SyncSport, uh, and this is how it actually looks like. Uh, so you have this smartphone app, and you can actually uh, just add your own recipe. So this is the recipe for this beer, so it's a pills recipe. Uh, so you can enter in uh, your target temperatures, you can enter in your target times, you just hit play, it connects to the cooker, it connects to the remote temperature, and uh, it does all the meshing process automatically. And uh, this is also the, the, the chart from the beer I made over here. Uh, so as you can see, it works quite okay. I know that the uh, values for the PID controller are not yet optimized, uh, so there is room for improvement. And this is actually the point where the automatic meshing process ends and where the uh, boiling process or the, the lottering and boiling process keeps on going. So you see the power of the induction cooker over the time, you see the green line is the set point temperature, the blue line is the actual measure temperature, and uh, this actually works quite stable now. I'm still surprised, uh, but anyway, I'm happy with it. The question is, why did I use this setup? Um, because uh, people could also say, why are not uh, connecting from the cooker hardware to the remote temperature to make everything in a more or less uh, closed loop setup? Uh, well, that's actually a good point, uh, but this setup is actually an easy to understand IoT setup. And the reason why I did it this way is because the uh, debugging of the Android app is a little bit easier because every time I wrote a new firmware for the cooker hardware, I had to disassemble the cooker, I had to take it out because I didn't want to touch it with the three, 230 volt and all the, uh, uh, and, and, and the earth and everything else, so I already killed enough induction cookers. Uh, so I just wanted to stay in the cooker and just control it, and that's actually it. And uh, with the Android app, I was then able to just write a new app, update the app, update the control process, uh, and this made it actually a little bit easier to uh, debug all this uh, setup. Uh, the controlling directly from the cooker is possible. I already worked on it. Uh, it's still not uh, implemented. Uh, so I, I started implementing it, uh, but it's still not finished. But I hope that I can at some point also finish it, because until now, I always need to take my smartphone and uh, then the whole controlling process stops. That's also not pretty nice. And if people try to call me, it's also a little bit different, difficult to talk to them while my smartphone is, is, is doing the meshing process. Uh, so uh, I, I, I try to do this, uh, to do all the controlling directly from the cooker to also add some over the air updates. I think that would make a lot easier for me. Uh, but until now, I'm having this set up. Um, here's a video of the whole process. So this is also the video I shot when brewing this beer. And I have the last two bottles of this batch with me. Um, so if you want to try it, first come, first serve. <laughs> you can, of course, try it. So you see the, uh, the induction cooker in this video. You see the temperature sensor. Um, then we also have this remote controlled switch with uh, where the pump is actually connected to and the smartphone. And as you will see here, this is actually, so I also have some other modes in the smartphone app to actually uh, adjust a, uh, a constant temperature, for example. But in this, uh, in this state, we're using a profile mode. So I'm entering 55 degrees and I want to hold it for 15 minutes, and then I can actually enter in all the information. Uh, and you see you have 64 
uh, degrees Celsius for 40 minutes, 72 for 20 minutes, and 78 for 20 minutes. So this is a typical pills recipe. Uh, and then in the background, you also saw that already the induction cooker started doing some stuff on the seven segment display. Then as soon as the, uh, as the induction cooker got, gets activated, also the pump gets activated, and uh, that's it for now. And the next thing that I'm working on uh, is controlling the fermentation process because with controlling the fermentation process, you actually also need to measure the temperature to keep the temperature uh, of the liquid at some predefined levels. Um, it's also nice to measure the original wort, so the amount of sugar and starch you have in your uh, liquid in order to know how much of the, of the starch has already been converted into alcohol by the yeast. And I would like to control it with uh, to also to control the fridge or a heater, depending on uh, what what kind of beer you do you're using. And I can already use this uh, or do this with the 250 volt switch, which then connects to uh, some uh, temperature and original word uh, probe that already built, but still was not enough time. To, to make it work also correctly. Uh, and finally, what I also would like to do is to automate the bottling process, because after you did all the fermentation, you need to fill it into those nice bottles, and you also need to add some of uh, a starchy liquid in order to give the yeast some more uh, uh, starch in order to create all the CO2 and the carbon dioxide to also develop a lot of flavor. So now I need to check the clock. Okay, um, because I still have a lot, uh, some, some more time, um, I can show you uh, what I already implemented so far for the fermentation process. Um, so I already created a board which is equipped with an IMU. Uh, which measures actually the tilt. So I'll have it in, in the next slide because uh, this tilt gives us the information about the original word and this is actually used to track the fermentation. And with this board, uh, I actually want to connect this board then to the pump and fridge control, which is the 230 volt control. Uh, and this is actually the idea behind it. So if you have a uh, liquid, which uh, a very starchy liquid with a lot of starch and sugars in it, you have a high original word, and then this device over here starts to swim on top. And as soon as the fermentation process starts and uh, the, the, the starch is getting less and less, it starts to uh, tilt towards uh, this position, so you know you have a low original word. And you can actually use this information to know how much of the starch has already been fermented by the yeast. Um, this is the uh, board already designed. Uh, where everything already works, I still need to combine everything together to also have it into a nice uh, setup with the control of the fridge and a heater. But there is actually just, uh, it's also an NRF 51840 uh, connected with an IMU. To be honest, I currently don't know what IMU I'm, I'm using, but it works. Uh, I also have a temperature sensor inside and um, this already did some, some experimentation, but there is still some improvements uh, that I need to do to also make the controlling of the process. All right, now I'm at the end of my presentation. And uh, if you would like to talk about this project, if you would like to get to know this project, um, I already started creating a documentation. Do not expect too much until now. If you want to get some more information, put pressure on me. I will uh, update the information as soon as possible. So on bruce.hirsch.zone, you can find the documentation. Uh, I made the hardware for the cooker and the thermocouple already available on GitHub. Um, but you can find the links on this website. Uh, they are 
a solder pad license, so everyone is free to use it and, and build their own uh, setup. Uh, and if you want to get in touch with me, you can uh, get, get in touch with me on LinkedIn or GitHub or write me an email, put some pressure on me, and I will hopefully release more of this information <laughs> as soon as possible. So that's it from, from me. Uh, if you have any questions, now's the time to ask. Uh, so the question was if I considered um, using a, a step motor to control the knob. Um, to be honest, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 from the beginning on, I just wanted to take everything apart and make it somehow in, in the hardware itself. Uh, but, this would be a, but this would be, of course, a, 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 maybe less expensive option. <laughs> Um, so the question was if I already considered because filling in the water into the pot is still a manual process and you're right. Uh, and the question was if I already considered um, making this also automatically to fill in the water automatically. Um, not yet. So there are still a lot of things that you need to do manually. Um, the meshing process is one of, I think, the most important one because you have to control the temperatures over a predefined period of time. So uh, that's, that's why I started with the, uh, with the meshing process and I'm still working on, maybe if I have enough time, I will do it also. But we're getting the water from a neighbor who has, uh, um, who has his own uh, well. And uh, so we're not using tapped water, uh, which also makes it not very practical. So I could probably use a pump, for example, and then pump it into the pot. But that's, well, I already have a pump. Maybe I could just connect it. <laughs> but, but I did not uh, consider it so far. But maybe if I have 15 more years, <laughs> there's still room for improvement. Okay, so the question was if I already was thinking about not just uh, controlling the temperature with a temperature sensor, but controlling uh, more or less uh, all the meshing process with uh, actually uh, reading the, the amount of starch that, ha that has already been dissolved. Um, that's actually a pretty nice question and I was talking about, uh, w about this with some other people just uh, a couple of weeks back. The problem is I do not know how to uh, measure the, uh, the, the, the starch in the water during the, the meshing process because uh, this gets up to 80 degrees Celsius and I do not want to have this uh, tilt sensor in this starch, on, uh, in, this, in this liquid uh, heating it up to 80 degrees Celsius. Uh, so maybe there is another possibility to uh, get uh, some sensors that actually measure uh, the already dissolved starch. I didn't have enough time to, to look up if there is something like this, but this is actually a pretty nice question. And if I get a, a sensor, then it's probably worth trying. Uh, lift 
Okay, so the first question was actually if uh, I'm considering CO2 that actually uh, is uh, created during the fermentation process. So yes, I was already considering it. And um, the thing is uh, that I'm already planning to create some kind of a small vibration motor so that the vibration motor more or less shakes off all the, uh, all the small bubbles that uh, are uh, created during the fermentation process and then read the measurements. So this would be one possibility because you're right, if you have the CO2 coming from, from the bottom, it might change the measurements. Uh, and the second question was, the battery, the battery life. Uh, and I'm having a lithium ion battery with 2,600 milliamps inside because I also need it for the weight. That's one reason why I chose it. Uh, and, and I think I could measure it for a couple of months. So this is actually, so I do not need to recharge it during the fermentation process and the fermentation process just takes one week. So uh, it takes about one week until one to two weeks <laughs> until the fermentation, depending on the yeast you're using, until all the starch from, from the liquid has been converted into alcohol. So there is enough um, battery available for all this uh, fermentation process. Very similar to the uh, ice What did what was the ice sensor? You that? Which sensor? Ice the ice sensor. Um, well, I started creating it from scratch because there is this ice spindle project, and they are actually patented patented this uh, process. Uh, well, actually, it's, I think that the, the first company was Tilt who actually made this, and ice spindle is also another open source project based on Wi-Fi. Uh, but I built all this hardware from scratch and also soldered it myself. Uh, but the drivers for all the, uh, uh, for all the uh, sensors that I'm using, I think they're already all pushed to the Cepha project because, uh, fun story, the Mach 31855, so I wrote the driver for this sensor. I opened up a pull request in, I, I think it was in 2020, uh, and it wasn't merged. And at some point I also, didn't uh, follow up on the progress of it. And just a couple of weeks back, I, I thought about, okay, let's check if there was already another person who implemented the driver for the sensor. And then I saw that it was already implemented, but another person, and thank you for that, uh, took my code and actually pulled, created a new pull request and then it got merged. So uh, the, <laughs> the, 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 the driver for the Max 31855 is already in the Cepha project and I think the other driver as well. All right, so if there aren't any more questions, thank you very much for your attention and <laughs> if somebody wants to try it, as already said, it's first come, first serve. Those are the last two bottles of the beer I made in the video. Thank you. <laughs>